Okay, so thanks Cynthia for, <laughs> again, sent slides, what, two, two three days uh, in advance only, but she's agreed to discuss, so. Uh, 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 joint work with Sujata, who's sitting there, and uh, Pushkar and Shandeep Mitra, who are toiling away nearer to the scene of action. Uh, so, in some ways, this is about decentralization, uh, and there's been a lot of literature uh, on, uh, you know, the argument for decentralization going back about 20 years. Uh, about uh, bureaucrats not being accountable, not having information about local conditions. Uh, so the argument for thinking about decentralization as a way of tapping into local information. <coughs> and there's been, while there has been some effort towards community management schemes, but by and large, uh, it's been about delegation to, to local governments, the implementation of, of projects. But uh, there's now a large literature that political decentralization is not a panacea, that local governments have subject to uh, objectives of their own, elite capture, clientelism, and so on. <coughs> so I think this gives rise to the question of, well, should we give up on decentralization, or maybe we should think of alternative ways to decentralize. And uh, what we are going to be thinking about this Obviously, you know, you can think of NGOs as an alternative to local government or communities, but we are going to think about intermediaries and private intermediaries. Uh, so we are going to look at uh, private intermediaries as an alternative to local governments in the context of a microcredit program for poor farmers. So the idea is that private traders, lenders within local communities have a lot of information about productivity of different farmers. So this is, this is a, a, an experiment we, we're trying to encourage farmers to cultivate high return cash crops. And the question is who has information about, <coughs> uh, about who's a good farmer? Now of course if you delegate to private trader lenders, they may also have all kinds of strategic objectives. Uh, they might not want to reveal their private information or they might engage in corruption. <coughs> so to overcome these problems, you know, so you think of uh, Designing a mechanism is a grand term, but you know you, you tinker with uh, with the terms under which these intermediaries are appointed. You could try to incentivize them by so that's what we do here. We give them a commission, so they they're hired as agents, uh, and uh, they are given commissions which are based on the repayment of the loans of the clients that they recommend. And then we try to restrict uh, their choice in other ways. Uh, for instance. Uh, the kind of farmers that they can choose. So context is, uh, so this is an agricultural uh, microcredit program in West Bengal, India. And it was uh, uh, trying to get poor farmers to invest in high return cash crops, especially potato. And it grew out of extensive discussions with uh, traditional microfinance clients who kept complaining that somehow they weren't really benefiting from the, the, the group based uh, mechanisms. And one of the main reasons is that they couldn't use the loans. The loans were too highly structured, especially with regard to repayment requirements. Uh, that, so it didn't enable them to invest in, in agriculture. And when we asked them, what would you really like? And they said, we would like to be able to invest in, in, in agriculture and in cash crops. So we tried to also ask them about, you know, what, what about the, the microfinance schemes do you don't like? They hated the, the groups the joint liability, uh, they hated the group meetings, they hated the savings requirements, all of that. So we said, okay, let's get rid of all that. So these are individual liability loans, and the selection mechanism is that the borrowers are going to be, they're not going to be self-forming groups, but it's the choice of who's going to be offered this loan uh, is going to be delegated to a local agent. And villages are going to be allocated randomly to one of two treatments. So trail is where the agent is chosen f randomly from a list of established local trader lenders uh, who have been operating in the village, have a minimum clientele, have a decent reputation. And grail is where the agent choice was delegated to the local government. <coughs> the role of the agent, uh, so each uh, village typically has something like 150 to 200 farming households. Uh, so the agent was asked to recommend 30 borrowers. Uh, 
from households. And the restriction was that the household should not own more than one and a half acres of cultivable land. And so this is to prevent them from you know, appointing their cronies and cousins you know, who were quite wealthy. Now out of the 30 that they recommended, uh, 10 were going to be chosen by lottery by us. Uh, but this is a public lottery held, not a public lottery, it was held within the, the, the local government office. Uh, the, the 30 borrowers that the agent would recommend, the agent did not want it known to be, uh, to be made sort of known publicly which 30 he had selected because he was afraid that he would have to explain to those he had not selected. So this, this list was private, but the drawing from the, this particular list uh, 10 were chosen in, in a lottery which was held in the local government office uh, and then those 10 were informed. <coughs> Both types of agents were given the same contract. We were worried about the willingness of uh, the, uh, the traders to accept this contract because we built in uh, both sticks and carrots. So part of the stick was that they put up a penalty, uh, a deposit for every client that uh, they recommended. And if the client defaulted, then they would forfeit that deposit. <coughs> so there was some risk involved. But the, the, the carrot was that uh, the interest that was paid by the recommended clients, uh, we gave them a hefty fraction of that, 75%. And we made this generous enough, partly because we wanted to ensure that they accept the offer, and partly because when you think about the possibility of corruption, the commission rate is sufficiently large, it eliminates the incentives for corruption because it internalizes the objective uh, of the lenders. Yeah. yeah. So, so they had to recommend 30 if they thought only 20 were creditworthy? Yeah. 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 They, they, they could just recommend fewer than so, so typically, actually, we, when we did a pilot, you know, we restricted that choice in other ways and they kept complaining that we didn't let them recommend more. Uh, but I think, yeah, in general, uh, they all had no problems recommending 30. <coughs> now, we also wanted to ensure that there was no other formal role for the agent. Uh, so once he'd recommended, given us a list, all it took for the guy was an hour or so. He said, give me an hour, come back after an hour, I'll give you a list. And then he was done. And then he would just keep collecting the commissions. That was in a formal sense. Uh, but of course, you know, we expected, given the fact that they were important, you know, nodal points of economic networks, that they would, you know, keep inquiring, reminding borrowers of when the, the loans were due, maybe putting pressure on them. We don't know exactly what's happening uh, behind the scene. So we were working with an NGO because as researchers, we are not authorized to hand out loans. So we were working with an NGO that was uh, an MFI. So all subsequent borrowing lending functions were implemented by that NGO. So they were going to the doorstep of these borrowers. Yeah. Do you know who the agents would have chosen if they were given the choice? Who, who they would have chosen? Um, no, I, we didn't try to elicit that. OK. So now the features of the loan, uh, the, I'll, I'll show you the baseline credit details. The informal interest rates. Uh, that trader lenders charged was ranged between 21 to 29 percent with an average of about 25 percent. So we wanted to give a low interest rate relative to uh, the informal market. So it was an 18 percent uh, annual rate. The loans were for a four month duration <coughs> and the timing coincided with the potato crop cycle. We wanted to facilitate the cultivation of potato. The loans were individual liability so we got rid of all the stuff they hated. Uh, no groups, meetings, savings requirements, and then we made it extra convenient, doorstep service. The, um, uh, the NGO would go to their house and uh, once every four months and basically hand out the loan or collect uh, on the last one. Uh, there were eight cycles. So we started in October 2010 and it went till July 2013. For the borrowers, we provided dynamic repayment incentives. Uh, in the standard way, we started with small loans of 2,000 rupees. Typically, uh, they, they were borrowing of the order of seven or 8,000 rupees uh, for their farming. Uh, but we built in fast growth of credit access, conditioned on past repayments. So they were entitled in the next four-month cycle to, uh, to credit of 
of the amount of loan that they had just repaid. And so it grew pretty fast. And towards the end, most of them were not fully utilizing their entire credit limit. <coughs> and then there were sort of termination clauses. We, we allowed them to not repay the full amount, but between 50% to 100%. But if it fell below 50%, then they were terminated. That was officially called a default. Otherwise, they could uh, whatever they hadn't repaid was added to that debt, which was carried forward. And we also built in partial insurance against village level potato price and yield risk. Now, the main findings, uh, the average treatment effects, which I'll show you in detail. For trail, there were significant average treatment effects on potato output of 26%, profits 41%, and farm value added of 21%. Sorry? Trail, trail is the private trader. And Grail is the Grail for Gram Panchayat, which is the local government. Okay, so G for government. Okay, T for trader. <coughs> so the private trader uh, intermediary intervention resulted in significant uh, average treatment effects on output, on profits, and farm income. For the Grail, we had significant similar but slightly lower average treatment effects on output of potato. But the effect on potato profit was, uh, was insignificant. It was 3%, so it's much lower. Uh, and farm value added was only 2%. <coughs> and the difference in the average treatment effects between trail and grail was significant at the 10% level. Now, in terms of the uh, financial performance, both schemes achieved similar repayment rates of 95%. And the trail loans had a higher take up, 81% as against 67%. Were the grail loans also incentivized for the grant? Exactly, exactly the same way, yeah. So the person, personally, they could take home that money? Yes. yes. Yeah. So after showing you, yeah, Scott. The take up rates as being sort of consistent with rational expectations about the profit effects, or, or are these sort of disjoint? Or do you think of them as sort of disjoint findings? Uh, I guess a bit of both. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know to what extent they really understood the scheme and how well it was going to work. Uh, but the, f you know, uh, but, you know, in terms of the formal features of the scheme, they were very similar. Uh, so we don't really know why Grail achieved a lower take-up rate. Uh, but, you know, maybe this is something we can discuss at the end. Uh, in ter I mean, as you see, the impacts were really quite different. So I don't know if they were really that far-sighted. Uh, so what we do uh, is use a semi-structural model to estimate farmer productivity. And we find considerable heterogeneity in productivity and rates of return across farmers. And then we look at selection. And we find evidence of positive selection in both trail and grail. So recommended borrowers, so the 30 that were selected, uh, compared to those who were not recommended, the recommended borrowers were more productive than those not recommended. <laughs> However, when you compare the recommended borrowers in trail with the recommended borrowers in grail, the trail recommended borrowers were more productive. In the sense of first order stochastic dominance. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. If output went up by roughly comparable amount, but profits very widely, were they, were they more? So the costs positive? were much higher in the, for the grail farmers. Yeah right, yeah, right. So that's consistent with this that the productivity was higher in trail. <coughs> However, to our surprise, so we expected that this selection difference between trail and grail would explain most of the difference. Uh, in the average treatment effects, it turns out to a, that it accounted for a very small fraction, about 5%. Depending on how you, how you compute it, uh, I, I'll go into the details. But you know, it goes from between 5 to 15%, depending on how you decompose. And then what seemed to be really important is that trail achieved higher treatment effects conditional on productivity. And these were mirrored by effects on the intensity of agent farmer interactions, monitoring and help. So in some sense, this is kind of the surprise uh, that we encountered, that you give farmers of the same productivity, the same loan with exactly the same features, and you have such dramatically different outcomes.
Yeah. Yep. Just about their self-reported well-being. They're being pestered all the time. <laughs> and one explanation would be that this your your trail chap shows up every day. Says, "Have you done this? Uh, why are you still sleeping? Whatever." <laughs> <laughs> I'll show, I'll show you, you evidence of that, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But Sujata, do you know if we we had? Did we ask any questions about? Jacob Wilson. No. no. Yeah. yeah. Are they buying their uh, seeds <coughs> and fertilizers from the traders themselves? A lot of them are. Yes. So there's extensive. I'll show you. I'll focus especially on the output sales. Uh, but they are. Uh, we have data on on transactions. Uh, we haven't really looked at the input side. Yes. Yes. <coughs> uh, and and actually, we don't really find significant price effects. I see. Your yeah. grail. Oh, sorry. Just not, the, the grail borrowers are also borrowing from the same set of traders. It's just that they're not. But the agent who recommended them and the agent who's interacting with them is not. For most, for most of the grail villages, they are not traders. The grail agent is appointed by the local government, and he's kind of a political functionary. Yeah. yeah. So am I remembering from your earlier summary that this extra effort didn't actually lead to more income for them? Like there was just the same default rate and the same one uh, The default rate was the same, yes. And is there a higher difference? Like did this pay off if the trail people put in more effort? Like it doesn't seem rational. At least I suppose it's not rational. The, yeah, actually. There is, yeah, there is some evidence that they put in a little more effort. And yeah, so at, at the end of it all, what I'll show you is that for the low productivity borrowers, which is where a lot of the action is for Grail, uh, the agent, the Grail agent was spending a lot more time with them. The no, the Grail agent in, in the, the, the government uh, mediated scheme. And their treatment effects, actually the point estimate is negative. So there's no evidence that those bottom guys and so the, there again, the, I mean, the, they may not have known what they were getting into. So we don't really understand what they got out of it. These low productivity guys in Grail. Uh, maybe they just wanted to cultivate good relationships with the local government, you know, which is a non-pecuniary advantage. Uh, but there were certainly, I mean, uh, I think Abhijit's point is probably right. Uh, that there was a lot of monitoring, the, the agent was dropping by to check. I think, I mean, our interpretation, I'll show you a, a model at the end, uh, which is that it was really more monitoring to prevent default. The Grail agent was worried that the, having chosen a lot of low productivity people, uh, that they would default. The guy, the trail guy that shows up on your staff, not only is he monitoring, maybe putting pressure on these people, but he might also have information that might be for his gang, so to speak. That, is, that is true. So it's possible, OK. So I mean, there are two aspects to that. And I'll, I'll get into sort of this aspect of the explanation towards the end. But A, it's possible that the private trader, his help or his intervention was more in the nature of help rather than monitoring. And I'll show you evidence that he was focusing on the high productivity farmers and not the low productivity farmers. And I'll, you know, so I'm just sort of jumping ahead of the story. Uh, the story is that there's going to be an economic incentive for the private tra trader to be focusing on the high productivity guys because he expects to benefit from output that they're going to sell to him, which he's going to resell at a profit. Yeah, but the question is, these averages, figures that you were providing us with, are they partly due to low productivity guys for the trail guy? Or does he bring them up? Uh, because he's also related to the high productivity guys and that there's some learning going on or pressure, um, you know, competition. You know what it's like when you have group, a group of members right. that compete with yes. each other yes. in yes. a positive way. Yes. Yes. Um, so can we know, do we know something about what happens to the low productivity guys in this trail group? So we, I mean, we do see okay. positive okay. treatment effects. We see positive treatment effects in trail for the bottom group. Yeah. Whereas we see a negative effect in Grail. So there is something different happening. Uh, absolutely, yeah. <coughs> OK, so uh, related literature. Uh, so obviously, large literature on targeting and networks uh, that's developing. Uh, 
so I, I guess Bandera and Rasul some time ago on technology diffusion and, and the importance of local networks. <laughs> and then a sequence of papers that Abhijit has done with lots of people, Ben Olken and Alatas and others in the context of Indonesia. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Natalia and Ben, uh, their work on India uh, is also related. <coughs> and we did a, on the issue of microfinance per se, uh, we did an earlier paper where we had a third treatment which was group based loans. And uh, we compared trail with the, with the group based scheme where five borrower groups were self forming. And that turned out to achieve negligible effects on potato and farm incomes. And in that context, selection differences explained at least 30 to 40 percent of the average treatment effect differences. But in this paper, we are just focusing on individual liability loans. So the loan features are exactly the same, and it's just who the agent is. So this is the uh, roadmap. Uh, I'll explain the, the context and the design, the average treatment effects, then go into the conditional treatment effects and how we, we get that and the decomposition. And then at the end, hopefully, I have a little time, uh, a little toy model to explain the results. <coughs> so we are focusing on potatoes, and I'll show you some numbers on, on uh, it's a leading cash crop in West Bengal. And we focus on two uh, leading potato growing districts, Hooghly and West Mednipur. And we have 24 villages for both trail and grail divided between the two districts. It lasted uh, eight four month cycles. And the data we did uh, intensive farm surveys of 50 households per village in each cycle. This 50 is broken up as follows. The 10 people who were offered the loan, uh, we call them treated. Then there were 20 that were recommended but were unlucky in the lottery. So they were not treated, but they were recommended. So we're going to call them control one. And then of the people who are not recommended, uh, we choose 30. And uh, of the 30 non-recommended, we, we sampled randomly from the non-recommended population in the village that was eligible potentially for selection because they owned less than one and a half acres of land. So that's control two. And the idea is that we can sort of separate treatment and selection effects. Uh, the selection effect is going to be of the difference between control one and control two because neither of them got the loan. Uh, the only difference is that control one was selected and Control one by design didn't know that they had been selected. Nobody in the village knew that they had been recommended. And the difference between treatment and control one, uh, since it was chosen randomly, uh, the, the, the treated people, so you can get the treatment effects conditional on, on selection. <coughs> so these are very quickly household characteristics and, and uh, the, the balance check between the two sets of villages. But uh, I guess the numbers are too small to be read. Uh, Nothing really important, 44% of household heads cultivation is the main uh, occupation. Uh, for the other 34%, one thirds, uh, it's uh, the agricultural workers. Uh, there's a lot of landless in, 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 in this population. Uh, education is pretty low, only 40% have uh, education beyond uh, primary school. Uh, own about half an acre of land, including homestead. Uh, Land holding is also about half an acre of, of cultivable land. Uh, <coughs> now, the three most important crops uh, uh, are sesame, paddy, and potatoes. Uh, about 70% uh, are growing both paddy and potatoes. Uh, the acreage in paddy is higher because paddy is cropped uh, at least twice, uh, whereas potatoes by its very nature, it's cropped only once. It's, a, it's an autumn crop, so you, you plant it between October and December, and then it appears after about 10 weeks. Uh, that's the only time of year you can do it. You can see that they spend a lot more on potatoes, partly because it requires expensive seeds and fertilizers compared to the other two crops. But the revenue is also substantially higher, and so they end up with a much higher value added. And if you look at the value added per acre, it's almost three times that of paddy. But it's, uh, the prices fluctuate a lot. And Sujata and I have an earlier paper where you know, document the extent of uncertainty in, in the potato price. 
And in that paper, we also showed that the middleman margins that the traders earn is, is really quite amazingly high. At least 30 to 40 percent of the wholesale price is, is, is a net middleman margin How to the traders. How big is the risk between these three? Sorry? How big is the risk between these three, apart from the fact that it's we, we haven't calculated that exactly, but you know, I'm, I, my guess is that potatoes is much riskier. So it's basically a high mean, high risk crop. And it also requires more credit uh, because the, the, the cost uh, is much higher. Now, the baseline credit details, so these are crop loans. And basically, when you look at total borrowing and crop loans, they're quite similar. So I'm just going to focus on the crop loans. What you can see is that uh, two out of three, uh, so this is, again, for the population owning less than one and a half acres of land. And everything I'm going to say in the paper is, is for that subpopulation. Uh, two out of three uh, loans are from trader lenders, professional trader lenders. The interest rate is about 25%, four-month duration, not collateralized. Family, friends, slightly cheaper, but relatively few loans. Uh, <coughs> also four-month, well, little, uh, maybe six-month duration, uh, also not collateralized. MFI penetration was quite low at the time that we were doing the experiment. <coughs> the interest rate much higher, uh, longer duration. But the remaining, uh, you know, the most important source, uh, formal loans were cooperatives, 25%. Uh, uh, lower interest rate but, uh, and longer duration, about 10 months, but uh, collateralized. And banks, even cheaper, uh, also about 10 months, uh, and also collateralized, by and large. <coughs> so I mean, basically, most, most farmers here are relying on informal credit. And the other fact to keep in mind is that we've done trader surveys here. The cost of capital of the traders themselves, who have other businesses on the side, their cost of capital ranges from 20 to 24%. And the interest rate that you see, the average interest rate is about 25%. So they're not making money on credit. And you know, if you're interested in interlinkage and so on, we've, we've looked at all of that. There's very little interlinkage here. So the credit market you should think of as reasonably competitive. Okay, but where they're making the money is on the potato transactions. Agent characteristics. So now the comparison between Grail and Trail. The Grail agent is uh, <coughs> is uh, is the, the modal uh, Grail agent is a is a farmer, uh, and then but uh, one fifth of them have some kind of shop or business. Whereas the trail agent, 95%, 96% are, are, are uh, business people. The trail agents are slightly wealthier, but less education. But in terms of political status, uh, the grail agent is, as you would expect, uh, is more likely to be a village society member, a member of the party hierarchy, or a member of the local government, or the self or family, somebody in the family ran for the village head position. Uh, baseline agent farmer interactions, so first with regard to economic transactions, which includes l borrowing lending, crop sales, input purchases, or employment, uh, substantially higher with the trail agent than with the grail agent, uh, and particularly on the two most important economic relationships. <coughs> the, uh, on the other hand, there's a bigger match of caste and religion with the grail agent. Uh, and then in terms of social connections, uh, they're about similar. Uh, so it's just uh, meeting at least once a week, 98% in both cases. And uh, inviting, the agent invited the household on special occasions in the agent's home is about one third in, for trail. So you've got extensive social and economic uh, relationships. And the economic relationships are more important for the trail agent, which is also understandable given their occupation. <coughs> Political connections, actually, because these are sensitive questions, we didn't really want to ask people about uh, political connections. So now moving on to the average treatment effects. So this is the, you know, the standard specification of the regressions. Uh, so we have interactions of uh, the treatments with, uh, with the treatment group and the control one group. So the default is the control two group. And then we put in a bunch of controls household controls and, and year dummies. Uh, all this is sort of at the annual level. And standard error is clustered at the Hamlet level. <coughs> so the first, 
uh, treatment effect on the amount borrowed is about similar in both trail and grail uh, for all agricultural loans. But when you look at non-program agricultural loans, which is loans from all other sources, you find, find almost uh, no effect at all. So there was no crowding out of loans from other sources. These are the main average treatment effect results. So you see a bigger effect in trail, but that difference is not significant. Similarly, for output, but where the differences uh, are more important are in potato value added and farm value added. And value added means that you account for all paid inputs, but you don't account for things like family labor. But you, you get pretty similar results uh, if you value family labor at sort of wage rates varying uh, all the way up to the market wage rate. The take up and the repayment rates. <coughs> Uh, you find a higher take up in, uh, in, 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 in trail uh, and the repayment rates are about similar. So those are the average treatment effects. Let me now move on to our, <coughs> now we're trying to sort of figure out what drove these differences and focusing first on selection. 13, okay, I, I should speed up a bit. <coughs> So let me explain first how we estimate productivity. So uh, we suppose that a farmer's TFP is, is not time varying, and that's capital YI. And there is a PVT is a village yield shock, <coughs> and L is the size, is the, uh, the acreage devoted to potato. We're focusing mainly on potato here. And L is, is, is the acreage uh, devoted to potato and essentially the costs are proportional to the acreage uh, because of the seed and the fertilizer requirement. Uh, so the returns depend on the scale of cultivation and it's isoelastic. We're assuming that the credit market is competitive and the row VT is the cost of capital to lenders and there's Bertrand competition within the village and the lenders have perfect information about farmer uh, productivity. So in, in equilibrium, the uh, borrowers end up internalizing the cost of capital. So the default risk is built into the interest rate. And there may be a, a, a small fixed cost associated with potato cultivation. <coughs> so this generates a, 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 a regression for the scale of cultivation for farmer I in village V in year T, uh, where the fixed effect of that regression is, uh, is a monotone function of the TFP. It's actually the log of the TFP divided by the elasticity of the uh, output with respect to the scale. And then there is a term which depends on year and, uh, and village effects, which incorporates sort of yield shocks as well as the cost of capital shocks. And this is, of course, provided that the productivity is above some threshold level because uh, for people below, it, the profits they're going to make is not going to cover the fixed cost. You can get a similar expression for their output, the potato output. So we can use either acreage regressions or output regressions and use the farmer fixed effect in that because we have data for three years. So we can back out these fixed effects. <coughs> and we, we do our productivity analysis either way, you know, acreage based or output based and the results are very similar. So I'm going to show you only results based on acreage. Okay. Now, there's one complication that 30% of the control group did not grow potatoes. Uh, so those are the people for whom productivity fell below the threshold. So for them, we can't figure out what their exact productivity was, but we know the upper bound of the productivity was, was the threshold itself. So we just pool that whole group and we assign them the productivity associated with the threshold. It doesn't really matter what you assign them. But we have essentially for those who do cultivate a continuous estimate of productivity. Uh, so sometimes I show you those continuous sort of distributions of productivity, or sometimes we just group them into two bins, uh, below median and an above median. So when we show the discrete data, we have three bins. Bin one are the non-cultivators. Bin two are the below median, cultiva below median cultivators. And bin three is the above median cultivators. Okay. <coughs> Now, how much does productivity vary with observable household characteristics? Uh, the R you put in all the household demographics uh, and you get an R squared, which you know, no matter what you put in, you really get an R squared above 30%. <coughs> uh, 
So it's hard for an outsider uh, or an NGO or whatever or a lending agency to go into a village and get data, get them to fill out application forms and so on and be able to predict productivity. So this is where the role of the agent comes in. The agent, having e interacted with them extensively in the past, uh, has a better ability signal uh, based on those informal interactions. So that's the whole idea for the intermediation. Can I just ask you a question? Yeah. Go back to the old, the other yeah. picture. Um, depending on the uh, religion or culture of the household, uh, does that affect who's really in charge? Is it the, ma the female or the male? Even though the male might be the household patriarch. There might be an interaction effect. I wonder if you know anything about there that. There may be, yeah. Is it always the male in charge, or does it interact with religion and caste, for example? I don't think we, we, have, we haven't looked at that question. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the cumulative distribution function of ability for the control one and the control two groups. And what you see is you get first order stochastic dominance. The control two group, which is the solid CDF in both trail and grail, uh, you get first order stochastic dominance. Okay, and uh, what I'm showing at the far side, so you do a Kolmogorov-Smirnov uh, test, and it's significant. However, these productivity estimates, having been estimated, you have to bootstrap, and so what we have in brackets is that when you do 2,000 replications of the bootstrap, the proportion of cases where the trail first order <laughs> the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test at 10 percent passes. Now, what's perhaps more important, yeah, Ben. Um, do you make anything of the fact that it sort of looks like the distributions overlap at the top, or do you think that's just a property of CDF that eventually they have to intersect? They have to, yeah. That's okay, where so you're getting to the top. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> this, does this just mean that the, that the trail people are choosing people who are growing up, have a higher percentage of their land on? I'm in potato. Like is, is, the, is the productivity here entirely identified by the, by the by acreage and potato? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be some. Could be they're not selecting productivity, but there's for some other reason selecting people who grow a lot of potato. True. Could like be. They want to be buying their potato crop later on, and they figure if I choose you, you'll feel loyal to me, and then you'll sell me your potato. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> But I'll show you now, well, we look at rates of return and how they vary with this. Yeah? And this is now the comparison of the selected group, but selected but not treated, the control one groups between trail and grail. And you get a higher productivity selection in trail. And this true is, uh, 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 satisfies first order stochastic dominance. <coughs> so you have superior selection of productivity. Now, uh, let me, I, I'll get back to showing some, some estimates of rates of return, but uh, let me uh, explain so how we compute uh, conditional treatment effects. Now, the problem is that a particular farmer who is treated, uh, how do you assign them uh, uh, a productivity? Because their productivity could be affected by interactions with the agent. The agent might be incentivized to interact with them more intensively. So uh, what we assume is, okay, that, well, let's, YIR is for treatment R. The productivity YIR could differ from the productivity if the guy was not treated. Now, the treated farmer uh, receives this offer of R loan, and R loan will be repaid with some probability depending on whether the guy was successful with his crop. So the, the, the default in the model is going to be generated by, there's a certain probability that there's going to be a total crop failure. And then because of limited liability, the borrower will not be able to repay the loan. So the, the default rate is really going to be the, the likelihood that the crop is not successful. So the crop is repaid when the crop is, so the loan is repaid when the crop is successful, which is probability PI, which also is, is, is farmer specific. <coughs> so uh, this is, the relevant calculation in terms of the choice of scale of cultivation for uh, a treated farmer. And we saw that the non-program loans didn't change. So we just assumed that the, those loans uh, were, had already been negotiated in advance, so they, they weren't uh, affected. 
So that's basically a, a fixed, uh, so we don't have to worry about it. So this generates a corresponding equation for the treated farmers. And the problem now is that, you know, now what matters, the fixed effect is a difference between now this altered TFP, but then you have to subtract from that the crop success rate. So in any case, this is not the productivity of the farmer uh, in the pre-treated situation. So how do you assign a productivity? Uh, so we uh, introduce an order preserving assumption, which, sorry? Four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, okay. I, okay, I better zip through this. Uh, so with the order preserving assumption, we just assume that the post-treated uh, productivities are monotone functions of the pre-treated. So what you can do is you can just order the treated farmers by their acreage or their output and then assign to them the productivity of, their, uh, of the person in the control one group with the corresponding rank. And then you sort of back out the conditional treatment effect by comparing outcomes with the control one person of exactly the same rank. Okay, so this is now uh, what I was promising you. This is how productivity varies in the sample and the rates of return computed for the treated farmers using the method th that I just explained. This big, the, the, the size of the dot gives you the, the proportions. So you've got this big clump of people who are non-cultivators in the control one situation. And then these are the cultivators and you can see that the rates of return vary uh, monotonically with productivity and the heterogeneity in the rates of return. So first is you actually do see that people who are more productive uh, according to our estimate achieve much higher rates of return and that the rates of return are really sort of going all the way from this is 100 percent, this is 200 percent, this is 300 percent. So there's huge variation in rates of return. So it's similar to uh, Ben and Natalia's findings. <coughs> Now the conditional treatment effects on farm value added, now when we, I'm going to show you discrete, discretized pr productivity bins from now onwards. So between bin one, which are the non-cultivators, and then the bin two and bin three are the below median and the above median cultivators. And what you see is that the conditional treatment effects on farm value added uh, are increasing and substantially higher for bin three. Uh, whereas for grail, for bin one, uh, as I explained earlier, the the point estimate of the treatment effect is negative. And then for bins two and three, the point estimates are positive, but none of these are significant. But the other important thing which we find staggering is that the treatment effects here are uniformly larger than the treatment effects here. And in fact, these differences, this difference for the bin three is statistically significant. So this is for us the, the main puzzle that people of the same productivity given the same loan achieve much uh, very, very different uh, outcomes. And this is a decomposition, so you go through a standard decomposition exercise and we find that <coughs> only 5% of this difference in the average treatment effect can be explained by the difference in selection. So it's the difference in the conditional treatment effects that's driving 95% of it. So why might that be the case? I guess I'm out of time, uh, but the story, well, to so have you a little model uh, but the main idea in the model is that the grail agents are focused on lowering failure rates. Uh, and help is more effective for lower ability farmers. So if you want to, for instance, if you're a teacher and your assignment is to lower the failure rate, then you want to focus on the weakest students. But if you want to raise the average score in the class, you want to focus on the strongest students. And so that's why the trail and the grail agents are doing, are focusing on entirely different. Uh, there's also partly a, a political story about why the grail agents are going for the bottom productivity people. And that's, <coughs> there's a, the grail agent has this a combination of economic, the commissions, and the political objective is to buy votes for the political incumbent. And this is a typical sort of clientelistic story. You know that votes, if you want to buy votes, it's cheaper to buy votes from the poor. So you try to focus on the, the lower productivity people. <coughs> And so we write down a model, deliver a couple of predictions which we test. I'll just show you the predictions. This is on voting patterns and you actually see that uh, the treatment effect on votes, we actually conducted a poll, uh, asked these people to uh, select from different political parties that were important in the local area. And so from that we could work out the selection and the treatment effects. And what we find is that there is a significant treatment effect in Grail on voting for the incumbent. There are no political effects in trail, which is what we would expect. And that 
most of this treatment effect is focused on bin 1, which is the lowest productivity people. Okay, so that is partly what explains the, the selection difference between trail and grail. Uh, this, is, this shows that this effect is, is uh, only appears in, in areas of, uh, of high political competition where the winning margin in the last election was lower. Uh, this is data on agent farmer interactions, conversations. So we ask farmers, what kind of conversations have you had with the agent in the last uh, three days? And this was in every four month cycle that we asked. And what you find is that the, 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 the lighter color uh, sort of rectangles depict the treatment effects. What you see is that for the trail agent, the trail agent by, by and large being a trader is a much busier person. So he spends less time interacting. Uh, the grail agent has more time on his hands. So the total amount of interactions is higher for the grail agent. But what's, I what's I interesting is that the pattern of interactions, the allocation of time of the trail agent is biased in favor of bin 3. But exactly the opposite is the case for the grail agent. And the grail agent is spending most of his time with these bottom, the, the, non, sort of the, the so-called non-cultivators, who are now trying to cultivate potato, uh, is spending a lot of time uh, interacting with them. And perhaps you know, what he's doing is, is essentially monitoring rather than helping. And uh, part of the reason why the trail agent is focusing on the highest ability agents is because he has a profit motive. He's buying the potato from them and reselling it at a profit. And so it makes sense for him to focus all his attention on the high productivity people. And you see uh, also the, the transactions, when you see the treatment effects on the transactions on output bought from the farmers, you see the largest effect in the bin three in trail. But in, in grail, because the grail agent is by and large not a trader, there are almost no effects on transactions. So anyway, let me stop here. I'm probably over time. <coughs> OK. OK, uh, great. So what I'm going to use my time to do is sort of, I, th I think, or to try to provide some context, which I think Dilla maybe you know, didn't have, have time to, to explain why I think this is both a, a very important and a very challenging uh, topic, this, this question of thinking about selection in, in, in credit markets. Okay, so, uh, you know, so, so Dilip talked about the, the general context of targeting for, uh, for development and, and anti-poverty programs, but I want to just talk a little bit more about why targeting might be both relevant and tricky, particularly in the context of microcredit. So we, we know there's an increasing body of evidence that returns to capital are on one hand uh, very high for, uh, for, for some firms, uh, but low or, or zero for, for others. Okay. We also know that, uh, that the average both impacts of and demand for microcredit are, are, are muted, and this has been shown in, in a number of, of contexts, you know, urban, rural, fast-growing, slow-growing, new markets, more mature markets, uh, and, and so on. Okay, and so bringing this all together, there's, I think, a growing consensus that, that heterogeneity among entrepreneurs, and, and including micro-entrepreneurs, is, is particularly, uh, particularly important. Okay, so again, so heterogeneity is important, but there are a lot of things, a lot of remaining questions that that leads that that, that, that leaves us to. First of all, is this heterogeneity uh, entirely latent? That is, you know, maybe unobservable to, to anyone except perhaps the agent him or him or herself, or is it partially observable or, or partially partially predictable? Uh, and if it's observable, is it, who is it observable to? You know, maybe maybe it's observable to, to everyone, but that seems unlikely to be the case. So it's pr there are probably some agents within the uh, within the the community or within the network that have better information. Uh, than, than others, and so if that's if that's true, that is if if uh, if this uh, heterogeneity is observable but not to everyone, then for those agents who can predict it, they have some potential uh, rents that they can that they can extract from that. And so how can those agents or those individuals who do have information about uh, the returns of others be induced to truthfully truthfully reveal it? Okay, All right. So how can truthfully how can truthful revelation uh, be incentivized? And one possibility is that it doesn't matter. All we have to do is uh, decide what the appropriate interest rate, and then you know, perhaps the market is efficient in the sense that everyone with a marginal product of capital above that interest rate will borrow, and, and others won't, and then, and then we're done. We don't need to, uh, we don't need to worry about uh, eliciting this information. It'll just be revealed through the decision to borrow uh, and, and not, or, or not. 
Okay, so that would be that would be be nice, but all of this work on targeting and credit suggests that that's probably not not the case. And, and indeed, I would argue it's not the case. You know, much like you know, on, for for a number of reasons. One is that in the same way that you know we could auction off hospital beds or we could auction off places in, in schools, uh, that is not uh, not without drawbacks in terms of, uh, uh, of 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 equity. Related to this, and this is I think especially relevant in contexts like uh, cash crop agriculture. They're likely to be incentive insurance uh, uh, trade-offs. So, if, if poor households are particularly risk-averse, then uh, you know a, the high interest rate that, that clears the market or in induces uh, completely, uh, you know, full separation and accurate revelation of who's a high return entrepreneur. Uh, this may inefficiently deter poor farmers who also may be may be high, who may have high returns due to uh, due to concavity in, in the production function. And then another related issue, I think, is, is spillovers. That there's uh, there's a, I think some recent work, uh, including uh, some of uh, a, a paper that I have with Emily Brezza and some some interesting work in, in Kenya uh, by by Ted Miguel and and, and his co-authors, that suggests that there can be uh, significant positive spillovers from credit access uh, through either uh, commodity prices or, or wages. And so if that's true, then the the the, the interest rate that sort of perfectly perfectly equalizes private incentives uh, in the sense of uh, uh, you know, in this in the sense of getting those with with the the right marginal products of capital uh, to to borrow, that may not be the interest rate we want to charge. We, we may actually want to lower the interest rate uh, uh, to uh, to uh, internalize these these positive spillovers. Okay, so all this by way of saying that maybe uh, you know just this this possibility of setting the right interest rate and letting uh, letting the market work it out in terms of who should who should borrow and who should not is is maybe not the way to go. Okay, so as as, as Dilla uh, alluded to, another possibility and one that for for a while was the uh, was the the I think predominant solution to this problem in the context of microcredit is, is is joint liability, and you know for those of you who aren't familiar, just very briefly, the idea there is that we we get together some number of people, let's say maybe five or ten people, and we make them all jointly liable for one another's loans, and so I'm not going to agree to be in a in a group uh, with someone who I think has a much lower uh, likelihood to repay than I do because I don't want to bear that uh, that downside risk, and someone who is much more likely to repay than than I am is not going to want to be in a in a pool with me. And so we're going to get efficient. Or we're going to get. Or we're going to have a separating equilibrium that's going to reveal uh, who uh, uh, that will reveal and cross subsidize uh, uh, risk uh, in in a in a way that can that can uh, help the market function more more efficiently. Okay, so that sounds promising. Uh, but, uh, and again, as, as Dilip alluded to, the, one of the challenges with, with joint liability is that it screens more on downside risk than upside risk. So it helps, uh, it may help to, uh, uh, to achieve low repayment rates, which are, uh, which is a, uh, something that's observed with, uh, in, in, in microcredit. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, this means that it's not attractive for high risk, high return uh, uh, undertakings like, uh, like, like cash crops. And then the joint liability has other uh, drawbacks, some of which Dilip alluded to. Not only the, uh, you know, the, the rigid uh, loan disbursement and repayment cycle, but there's also uh, concerns about excessive pressure from other group members to repay, even in even in states of the world where that might not be uh, where that might not be ex ante or, or ex post efficient. Okay, so so joint liability uh, is, uh, you know, has been one solution to this problem, uh, but it, it's it's also not a uh, not a not a magic bullet. Okay, so then an another, I, you know, I, I think very, uh, very cool and very interesting um, project related uh, related to this idea of achieving truthful revelation uh, is uh, the work uh, that uh, Natalia and Ben and, uh, and 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 Reshman have have worked on, uh, which I think has this amazingly cool name of the the Bayesian truth serum, where we can uh, where people can uh, be given incentives to. Uh, to true truthfully report uh, in a way that doesn't even require you to come back later and see whether it's accurate. You're, as I understand it, and, and Ben will, I'm sure, correct me, sort of in incentivizing people to give you su surprisingly common second-order uh, beliefs. Um, and yeah, so this this I think is a, is a really interesting, uh, a really interesting possibility. But it's 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 pretty complicated. It probably doesn't work in in, in every in every context. Okay, so another possibility, uh, which relates to work uh, by Greg Fisher and to uh, to the earlier paper by these by these co-authors, is instead to have contracts that look more like debt, to have contracts that look more like equity, to in some ways give uh, give the the recommenders or the screeners some of the upside risk uh, uh, of of the of the repayment. Now 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 here actually this is this is maybe a little bit misleading uh, because in in the context of 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 uh, of uh, Dilip and, and Sujata et al.'s paper, 
there's not, I guess, true upside risk, but there's this is kind of in the, in the gain frame rather than the loss frame in that, uh, in that the, the recommender is, is, being, uh, is, is getting 75% of the interest uh, paid. Okay, so we, maybe we can harness this idea of giving the screener upside in incentives. Uh, and, and the earlier paper by these authors uh, showed that this, this was effective, that these uh, trail or trader intermediated loans uh, achieved much higher returns than a traditional joint liability uh, uh, microcredit product. Okay, so in this paper, the authors are investigating the question, do the incentives of the screener matter? And the answer, the answer is yes, as, as you've just uh, seen. So the, the, the politically connected uh, grail, you know, I guess they're politically selected and politically connected. These grail agents don't just seem to select on return. Uh, they want to reduce the risk of crop failure, which is politically costly, and they also maybe want to buy, buy votes uh, for, for the incumbent. The trail agent, uh, on the other hand, have incentives that are better aligned with, with lenders. They want to increase the average uh, returns, both because of this uh, residual claimancy or this, uh, the fact that they're getting 75% of the interest, uh, and also because they're, they're, you know, they're buying the, uh, the potatoes from these, uh, from these lenders at, uh, at, a, uh, at a markup or at a, at a profit. Okay, so it appears that uh, one thing that does happen, although it's not the first order explanation, is that trail agents choose different and higher ability uh, borrowers, but they also provide complementary inputs and provide them in a, in a part of the distribution where, it's, where they're more effective at increasing average returns because they're, they're less worried about just cutting off this, uh, this left tail of, of reducing the risk of, of failure. Oh. Sorry? Okay, okay, great. Look, I have, I, have about two, I have about two more things to say, so that should be... Uh, that, sh that should be great. Okay, so I, so I just have a couple of, of questions and, and suggestions. So in some sense, it seems like what's going on here is that the, the separation theorem is, is failing for these grail agents. They're, you know, they're, they're, not making, they're not able to make the decision about how to uh, you know, influence, influence political outcomes in these villages in a way that's distinct from the allocation of, of credit. Whereas in a world where we thought that the, that the separation theorem uh, applied, the grail agents could you know, they, would, they might allocate those, those loans in a way that increased the total size of the pie, and then they could perhaps use their proceeds, uh, the proceeds of those interest repayments to, to buy votes or to compensate those low ability traders in, in other ways. So that doesn't seem to be a happening. That doesn't seem to be, I mean, in, in some, some maybe mechanical sense, that's because these grail agents are trying to achieve these two objectives with one instrument, which is giving out, uh, giving out these, these loans. And this seems to be a, a more general problem uh, with targeting uh, in, in other contexts um, relating to the, uh, the recent work by uh, Bandera Deserano at, uh, at, at all, uh, Lori Beeman and Jeremy Magruder's work and, and, and others. Okay, and so I think one thing that, that, that struck me as I was uh, reading, reading through the slides is what would happen if these conflicted agents were allowed to allocate two or more things instead of only being able to allocate uh, the loans. So let's say they could allocate the loans, but they could also allocate uh, smaller uh, grants, let's say, would that help to, uh, to, you know, to, to reduce this conflict of interest and kind of restore a world where the separation theorem uh, seemed, seemed more to, to, to apply? And then my final uh, question is, you know, in this context, it seems that the, the trail loans worked because the, the incentives of the trail agents were very well aligned with, with those of, of the lender. But, it, but will that be true uh, in, in general? Okay, so in, in some contexts, and in, indeed in this context, uh, uh, traders do appear to provide these other loans. They, to, uh, they, they, uh, they may also provide other inputs uh, to, uh, to farmers. And depending on the production function, these other loans could be complements or they could be substitutes with, with the microcredit loan. So in this case, empirically, it turns out that there's neither crowd in nor crowd out of these other types of credit, uh, but that's not going to be true. Uh, in, in general, and so my final, uh, my final remark is that we, we might want to think context by context about uh, what the incentives of, those, of the trail type agents are, uh, and that it might not be a completely general finding that the incentives of the trail, the trail, the trader agents are going to be uh, so well aligned with, uh, with those of, of NGOs. And so I think it would be very interesting to see uh, whether and how these results might replicate uh, in, in other contexts. Okay, so in, in summary, I, f I found this to be a really, really interesting paper and part of a really interesting research uh, agenda on harnessing community information. And I also think this is a really nice example of how uh, reduced form and structural approaches can, can be used in, in complementary and, and mutually reinforcing uh, ways. So again, uh, thanks. thanks very much. Described the, what the, uh, the grail agents are doing could have been described as 
you know, they come in functionally, they try to help the poor, whether they're doing it competently or not uh, is um, at issue and important, but first order, uh, that's what they're trying to do, and uh, that's their job. I, you could ever imagine saying that somehow our politics gets too much into the narrative. Right? So, I mean, you know, I, I have no view of whether, whether this is elite capture, rent seeking, whatever, or just they are doing their job. And I prefer a more neutral language. So if I'll let you take your last question. Well, so um, I, so it seems it, it seems it really depends on how how much of a government, how much these government bureaucrats or grandpa child people, how 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 much how much of a fixer that person is. So you can imagine different contexts where the government fixer has a lot more power or water or the productive investments. And in different, so your political connection actually really affects your productivity. And so maybe in this particular context, it doesn't. Yeah. 